So if you would, go ahead and turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, we're going to begin in verse 14. If, if you're unfamiliar, a little background, Timothy is an epistle that Paul had written to his spiritual son, Timothy. He had left him behind in Ephesus. Paul had gone and done ministry in Ephesus with the Ephesians, started a church, and left Timothy behind in order to maintain and to build out the equipping of the saints there in Ephesus. So as Paul moved on, went through many more churches, communities, towns, imprisonments, he stayed in touch with his spiritual son through letters, um, and challenging, encouraging, correcting at times. And this is where we find ourselves in 2 Timothy. It's the second letter that Paul wrote to Timothy that we have um, uh, understanding of, place in the word of God. And, and in here is a challenge that I believe God has given for the entire church, but I want us to take it personally. So 2 Timothy 2 chapter, or yeah, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14, it says, remind them of these things. He's talking to Timothy. He's saying, go back to your church, to the people in Ephesus, and remind them of these things, and charge them before God, not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. I want to pause there real quick. We're going to move on to 15. Has anybody ever seen any good come through Facebook arguments? I see people's lives change all the time through it. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Whenever we quarrel on these things, we don't bring any good, as Scripture says, but it only brings ruin to the hearers. Continuing to verse 15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. If there's ever an approval I want in this life, it's God's. A worker who has no need to be ashamed, but rightly handling the word of God, the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. What a picture. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus who has swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Now, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. That's where we want to be. Verse 22, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servants must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Lord, we just come before this morning, and I pray that your spirit would be here and stay here. I know you are because your word says that when two or more are gathered, that you are there in the midst. So God, as you are here, speak your word clearly, powerfully, and authoritative through me. Let your words be clear. Let them be true and unwarped. And let them pierce and change and transform our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we get going, I'm probably going to be doing a series on this called Let's Chat. Because I feel like there's some things about conversation and communication that as a church, we need to realign. Let's chat. And today's topic of let's chat is simply stop the quarreling. We've got to stop the quarreling. I've seen a lot of it on Facebook. A lot of it from Christian groups that I've known my entire life. At times, I'm guilty of it too. It's easy to do. It's easy to get frustrated. And it's easy to spew. And it's not just on Facebook, but in conversations with people in general. I've seen it amplify. And if you're honest, I think you would agree that you have as well. This year, the last four years, the last eight years, the last several months, 
since November, <laughs> quarreling has amplified in our world. And we see it. It's not just within the church. It's outside of the church. It happens every day at all hours constantly. Um, I've gotten to a point where now I, I put a timer on my Facebook that when I've been on it for 45 minutes for a whole day, it pops up and it says, you should leave. <laughs> and I'm like, thank you. And I take its advice and I, I get off. It doesn't make me leave, but it encourages me, your time's up. And I've had to do that because of how much it's affected this and how much it's affected this. And as we were praying this week at our prayer week, and as I was reading through scripture, and as I was seeking God just began to put this idea of quarreling on my heart and on my mind and challenging me that it's time for us to stop. So I want to break down this scripture and just kind of help us see a little bit more in depth what Paul is truly saying to Timothy. So when we look back at verse 14, he says, Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. What's interesting is this word ruins is a word that in, in the original context is catastrophe. And if you've heard that, you understand that it's really literally how we get the word catastrophe. It's catastrophe. Quarreling is catastrophe. It is directly connected. It's directly connecting. Whenever we quarrel with each other, we bring ruin upon ourselves, upon those who hear us. By ruin, by this catastrophe, it means to overthrow or to destroy cities. It's what they've used whenever you overcome and destroy a city in the Bible. It's the same word they use when it talks about bringing extinction to a spirit of consecration. So as we quarrel, as we feed that as a church, because listen, I know that we know a lot of people in this world that probably don't give two cares about what the word of God says or what the church believes on a given topic. I believe that's probably more true than we'd like to admit. But the truth is, is regardless of what they desire, it is still truth. And when we stand upon the truth and we behave as the truth has commanded us, it will have an impact and it will change the lives and the hearts and the minds of the nation around us. It has to have an effect. The word is living. It is alive. It is active. And what we speak will either bring life or death. And as we as a church, forget about people outside the walls, outside of the faith and the following of Jesus. Put that aside for a moment. When we as a church speak death and quarrel and division in our lives, we are directly responsible for the destruction of our nation. Understand that. We can blame government. We can blame politicians. We can blame uh, branches of government, all we want. But it is on our shoulders to correctly and biblically and truthfully represent the word of God and to speak life into it. Our quarreling truly can bring destruction to our nation and to our cities, and it can bring extinction to consecration. We can remove holiness and purity all through quarrelsome, and we are doing it in our lives and in the lives of every person who hears it. It's a dangerous game. It's dangerous. He is, Satan is going to do everything he can to bring quarreling within the word of God, within the Bible, within the church, within our faith, and he's going to do this to try to destroy us one person at a time. Anybody ever lost a friend over a stupid argument? You look back years later and you don't even remember what you argued about. You just know you don't have a friend anymore. It's happened. Quarreling, it will bring destruction. We jump down to verse 16 and, and verse 19. It says, but avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. And their talk will spread like gangrene. Down to verse 19, he's quoting scripture beforehand, and he says, Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Not only will quarreling bring direct destruction and ruin to our lives, to our cities, to our nations, but it will bring irreverent babel. If you begin to participate in a quarrel, no matter how right you are when you start, I promise you, you will not finish right. Won't happen. If you partake, you will fall to the level every time. It's a lot easier to pull somebody down than to lift them up. 
And when you jump into these arguments, to this quarrelsome attitude, to this divisive conversation, you will be brought down to irreverent babble every single time. I want to break down what that means, irreverent babble. Irreverent is a word, bebelos. It means ungodly, profane, common, worldly. When we begin to get to a place where our conversation is based upon the world, we're gone. We've misaligned it. We've missed it somewhere. A lot of times we start off with a zeal for God. We're on fire because it was done wrong and we're, it's dishonoring God and it's spitting in his face. And so what do we do? We immediately respond like the sons of Zebedee. Let us call down fire and destroy the cities. We begin to speak from a place of worldliness, from a place of curse, a place of ungodliness. When we speak something that is not aligned with the will of God, irreverent babble. And that word babble is uh, kinophonia, which means an empty discussion. It's fruitless. It's vain. We will begin to allow ourselves to start off with a good motive. But as we jump into quarreling, into division, and to this type of argument, then we will become to a place where our words are not only non-glorifying to God, it becomes worldly, but it's all for nothing. It's all for nothing. I do not want to get to a place alone where I say, God, my words did not represent you. They didn't represent you. They represented the rest of the world. And he's going to say, but I told you, be in it, but not of it. Yeah, I, but, but you see what happened was... They said something I didn't like. It's not a good justification. And we begin to speak in a way that reflects the world instead of God. I don't want to tell God that's what my mouth did. Let alone say, and it brought no fruit. Could you imagine if Jesus went to the cross? And I, I've said before, the greatest pain he endured, I believe with all my heart, was when God looked away. Everything else was horrible. It was painful. It was destructive. It was, I wouldn't want to endure it, but I truly believe the greatest pain Jesus felt is when God looked away. Could you imagine if he separated himself from God and it did no good? That's what we do when we quarrel. We separate ourselves from God and it does no good. Don't do it. It leads to deeper ungodliness. It brings, brings deeper destruction and pulling away. And as it says, it says that it begins to spread like gangrene. When I read this, I was, I, my mind was just blown away by the picture that Paul gave us. Gangrene's nasty stuff. Infection that eats away at everything and slowly dies. It slowly kills and destroys everything in its path. Our simple words, as we jump into quarreling, as we jump into arguing, as we jump into debating, begins to destroy not just the person that hears it, but everything around us now because it begins to spread. But we see in 19, it says, let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. We can't do something like this as believers. It's, it's not acceptable. It mentions it in the same conversation piece. I believe that Paul let us know very simply that we must say goodbye to iniquity right in the middle of this entire conversation because he wanted us to understand without a shadow of a doubt, quarreling is sinful. Our words and those conversations are sinful. They remove us from the target of God. They make us miss it. It's not acceptable to God. It is ungodly at its nature ungodly at his nature. And then, and then as I continue reading, God brought verse 23 into light. And in 23, he says, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. So he's bringing it again. Quarreling will be produced by these things or it produces these things. And we see that it's quarreling comes from foolish and ignorant controversies. And so foolish I think we all understand it simply means ungodly. Anything foolish is ungodly. It's the word moros means ungodly. Controversies is the word thesis, and it means to question and debate. Has anybody ever asked a question to learn? 
right? We ask all the time to learn. Has anybody ever asked a question to create problems? Yeah, suddenly nobody knows what I'm talking about anymore. Seth does. You know what it is. I've had my son. You can tell by the tone and the attitude. He'll ask me a question, and he doesn't want the answer. He wants to be a pain in my rear. Uh Uh-huh. And we do the same thing, right? Your boss tells you something at work, something we hear in the news, something from our governance, whatever. We don't like it. Well, why do I have to do that? You don't want to (laughs) know. You're not trying to find an answer. You are arguing and debating against I'm not saying that we blindly follow everything, but we do faithfully obey the word of God without exception. And when it says to obey the laws of the land and to honor leaders and authority, because all of it is placed by God, half the nation is having a hard time accepting that truth this year. Half the nation had a hard time accepting that truth four years ago. It's all placed by God, and we have to learn to accept that same truth the same way that Daniel ended up in Babylon. Because it was accepted and placed by God. We have to learn to step back a moment and say, okay, here's what I feel. Here's what I know. Here's what I believe. You can be fully right and 100% wrong at the same time. All based upon the choices we make in communication and how we present it and how we attack it. Foolish conversation, foolish controversies, debates, it will lead to quarrels. We've seen it. Again, I can depict just social media alone. All year, (laughs) the last four years, it's nonstop. You can't place an opinion, and it's not just speaking in an opinion all the time. Sometimes it's putting your opinion over somebody else's. What did you do? You just created a debate. You created controversy. You created um, strife and challenge unnecessarily. We're going to get to a place here in a moment, though, to help talk about because there is a time and a place but a way to do this. But when we do this, when we engage in these foolish controversies, it says that when we talk like this and we do this, that it literally births. It says it breeds quarrels. When we do this, we're literally birthing. We're creating in ourselves fights, contention, strife. It's not something that happened and we just are around it. It's something that we ourselves produced. We ourselves produced. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 3 says, it is an honor for a man to keep aloof from strife. It's an honor for him to stay away from it all, to be away from it, to be above it, to be gone from it. But every fool will be quarreling. We talk about foolish. Fool means ungodly. If we find that ungodliness equates to quarrels and we are living in a life of quarrel, we have some adjusting to do. We cannot do that and represent and be intimate with Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. It's impossible. Fools quarrel. The ungodly bring catastrophe. James chapter 4 verse 1 goes on and says, What causes quarrels? It causes fights among you. And he's writing to the church. And I have to point this out because so far it's all been about us quarreling outside the walls. It's all been about political stuff or disagreements or thoughts. But it happens in the church. I can't tell you how heartbroken I am that I saw people within the same church that I know this week argue over different political stances and one call on the other a democrat when they follow the same son of God as I do. It's unacceptable. And when somebody teaches you in love and gentleness the word of God and your response to that is the constitution and your amendments and not the word of God, you are not serving Jesus because your right should never overpower God's law. So when they tell you in loving and gentleness and kindness that it's not appropriate to talk like that as a believer, and your response is First Amendment, the Constitution is your word. It is your truth and not God. Quit quarreling. Stop it. It breaks my heart. It breaks God's. It's unacceptable. But it says there, it says, what causes fights among you? 
Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? They're war within you. What is he saying? He's saying that you are quarreling among yourselves within the church, outside the church, within your family, within political parties. You're doing all of this because you don't know how to tame your own fleshly desires. You're letting your passions control how you think and what you do and how you live. Instead of seeing the humanity in somebody, and instead of seeing the salvation in the soul in somebody, you are seeing them as an opposition, as an enemy. And you are attacking. Stop it. Stop it. And as we go down to verse 24 through 26 in 2 Timothy 2, it says, And the Lord's servant... Not just talking to Timothy now. He's talking about the whole church. Anybody who follows Jesus Christ has made him their master. Must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone. Everyone. We read over these things and we're like, amen, that sounds good, Pastor. But we don't do it. We don't do it. That's not kind. It's not loving and gracious. Be kind to everyone. Be able to teach And you have to ask yourself, as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, not just somebody who is believing that he did this, but who is convicted that he's done it, and who follows him and tries to imitate him, am I so close to him? Is my mind so much on the word of God instead of everything else, instead of my own passions and desires? Is it so much on the word of God that I can teach them the truth? Or do I argue my own desires because I don't know the truth? We speak what we know. We speak what we believe. We speak what we're convicted of. And if the word of God is not the thing you speak, it is not the thing that is of first foremost in your life. Be able to teach. This is a hard one next. Patiently enduring evil. What? I'm supposed to stand up against it and fight it and overpower it. The right way. The right way. But we are supposed to be able to look at somebody of what they've done, endure it with patience in order to teach them. It says, correcting his opponents with gentleness. I want to stop there real quick. That word correcting, when we hear this, we think authoritative, right? I've got the power to correct you. I have the power to tell you you're wrong. I have the power to, to bring down the, 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 the hammer in and to stop you in your tracks. It's not what it means. That word correcting is this word, um, padu, and it means to teach. To teach. That's why we have to be able to teach so that we can teach the truth, to correct them, to steer them away from a lie or from a false narrative. Correcting them, teaching them with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. we got to stop fighting. Because when we fight again, we see the people as our enemy. We see them as our opponent, but they're not. What does scripture say? Our enemy is not flesh and blood. But it's against the darkness of this present age of his principalities. That's the enemy. And when we allow our passions to rise up, it blinds us to spiritual truths. And instead of seeing somebody who disagrees with me as a brother and sister in Christ, who I need to lovingly guide them and show them, gently teach them, I see them as an enemy who is trying to stop what I believe. And I attack. We've got to stop. We have to be kind. Teach kindly. Endure evil patiently. Because what I can do when I endure it, I'm, I'm humbling myself to say they're being evil against me. They're attacking me. They're hurting me. But one day they might know Jesus. One day they might have repentance. One day there might be unity again. But we have to do it by teaching God's word, not arguing our own desires. Anybody ever been in a disagreement? <laughs> Just going to leave that vaguely there. Been in a disagreement? Ever, anybody ever been in a civil disagreement and then somebody raised their voice? Was it civil anymore? No. It lost all civility and it lost all fruitfulness. Because once you raise your voice, 
everything's done. Everything's done. What has happened? As we've seen in scripture, you begin to spread evil. It began to spread negativity and death once you inflamed and snared yourself up greater than the word of God. We can't do that. We can't argue our own desires. We can't be led by our own wants and desires. It has to be on the word of God. And this ability to teach with gentleness, to be able to do it with patience, is the only thing that could lead them to Jesus. Because I promise the moment we begin to huff and puff and to raise our voice and to shout, when it comes to salvation of humanity, the greasy will does not get or the, the squeaky will does not get the grease. It doesn't happen that way with salvation. It is through loving kindness, through that still small voice that they see and hear in you that will draw them to repentance. But we have to be there. We can't dismiss what is wrong and evil. But we have to encounter it and teach it correctly. When Jesus was being placed in trial for his life to be taken from him unfairly, untruthfully, every accusation against him was false. He never once defended himself. Never once did it. He endured evil patiently. He did it joyfully to the cross, Scripture says. And because of that, it brought salvation to mankind. We are his representatives. We are his mirror, his imitating agents. As he lived, we are to live. So when evil comes against us, we are called to endure patiently, to not defend ourselves, but to speak the truth of the word of God and loving, kind grace. It's the only way we will see a change happen. It may not happen tomorrow. It may not happen on the spot, but it will shift the spiritual atmosphere. It will shift the truth in your life, in the lives of those who hear you, and in the lives of the nation. Proverbs 15 once says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. This is where I said we can be 100% right and 100% wrong. Because so often we're zealous, like I said, to teach the word of God and to say that's wrong. That's wrong. You're blaspheming. That's heresy. You're out of line. The word of God says this. But we don't do it with love. We don't do it with a soft answer. We do it harshly and angrily. And it creates debate and quarreling. Do not allow the word of God to be the cause of somebody's death when it was given to us to bring life and hope. Scott, can I have you calling up here? Remember again, they are not the enemy. Scripture just tells us in the same portion that they are ensnared by Satan. They are deceived. They are lost. They are lied to. They are doing what they truly believe in all their hearts that is right. So quit spending time debating and quarreling over worldly things. Political affiliation. That means nothing in the kingdom of God. There's going to be a lot more Democrats in heaven than Republicans are comfortable with, and there's going to be a lot more Republicans in heaven than Democrats are comfortable with. It means nothing in eternity. And we spend all of our time dividing the church and our nation and our families over something that means jack in the scheme of eternity. Find the word of God. Pursue the Word of God and gently, lovingly, and kindly teach the Word of God. Nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. We have to stop the quarreling because we lose every credibility we would ever have. We would no longer be able to unashamedly share the gospel and truth because people would not see us as a true agent of the gospel. We have to represent this thing correctly. We've got to stop the quarreling. They're not the enemy. We're called to save them, not to slay them. we got to calm our words. Step back, breathe, and see the world through the perspective of Christ. Stop the quarreling.